<coughs> Thank you, team. Um, I have a story that I really want to tell uh, our sector. Uh, it's almost become a compulsion, and uh, whether people accept or reject what I have to say is sort of, I guess, up for them to decide. Today I've been given the opportunity and the honour uh, of being able to um, share this story with you, and for that I'm extremely grateful. I have chosen, perhaps incredibly stupidly, not to use a single image in this presentation. And anyone who knows me will know that that is not my usual style. So I do this, um, and I, I, this morning I've, I respectfully ask that you uh, instead lend me your ear uh, to consider these words and lend me your mind's eye to paint the landscapes I describe with justice. My story starts here in Australia. Our country, as you know, is a significant world in food and fibre producer with a large ag agricultural footprint. And our agricultural success in a competitive global market has been achieved using an intensive production model. And this has come at considerable cost, not only to farmers and to rural communities, but to our natural environment. In 2016, livestock grazing on exotic pastures occupied 71 million hectares, while dryland cropping covered a further 27 million hectares. Irrigated crops, pastures, horticulture take up another 2 million hectares. To varying degrees, all these forms of agriculture exclude, replace or impact on native vegetation, as can extensive grazing of rangelands. And as a result, our native grassy ecosystems in southern temperate Australia are diminished to a tiny fraction of their original range and are among our most threatened plant communities. For many decades, protection has been the primary conservation tool to halt the loss of our native grassy ecosystems. The Federal Environmental Protection Biodiversity Act, complemented by state-based acts, have led to the protection of many grassy community types. However, as Linda pointed out, ecological assessments continue to reveal ongoing degradation and destruction. And this brings into question our wisdom, or the wisdom of an over-reliance on protection-focused environmental laws, and it highlights the need for a complementary approach to halt and reverse grassy ecosystem loss, of which a prime candidate is surely ecological restoration. Now, ecological restoration embodies a wide range of beliefs and motivations, but broadly speaking, its goal is to restore or repair human-degraded native ecosystems. However, despite these seemingly benevolent goals, its validity is questioned by some who believe it capable only of creating pale imitations of nature. Others hold deeper objections, charging that the concept provides support for a human-centric worldview that nature destroyed can simply be replaced by technology whenever and where, where we want. And this low concept in the core principle and in its application, particularly among researchers and practitioners, has the capacity to weaken government support for restoration of complex systems. And evidence of this may be inferred from the fact that governments on both sides have historically directed environmental funding towards low-risk restoration approaches, such as those that primarily focus on tree and shrub layers, in the hope that the ground layer will miraculously reappear. However, without appropriate support and incentive mechanisms, there can be no viable market for complex restoration in this country. This situation leads to seed and restoration sectors small, poorly resourced and practically incapable of undertaking complex restoration at the scale that is required. Now, I've been involved in grassy restoration in Australia for many years and during that time, yes, there have been welcomed small-scale successes and these demonstrate that it is at least technically feasible to reconstruct grasslands and grassy woodlands in this country. This on-ground experience has also revealed many factors that restrict our capacity to restore these systems. And at the most fundamental level, complex ground layer restoration is limited by a lack of seed. There is simply not enough available in the quantities, 
diversity, quality and price to undertake restoration at scale. This limitation is not insurmountable if sea production approaches are employed, nor are other factors of a technical and practical nature insurmountable, such as the need for suitable restoration infrastructure, equipment and methods. If there is a viable market to drive investment and innovation. So to determine if similar factors affected a grassy restoration in the United States, I travelled to that country in 2016 with the support of a Winston Churchill Fellowship, which I'm eternally grateful for. And there I set out to examine the US seed and restoration sectors. I met and interviewed growers and restorationists, I toured seed farms and restoration sites to gauge the scale and complexity of these sectors and to contrast them with my Australian experience. I travelled extensively across a large area of the country during mid-spring so that I could visit crops and sites when they were active. This driving trip took me from Texas in the south to Minnesota in the north and from New York State in the east to Oregon and California in the west. And that was done in an awesome Dodge Challenger. <laughs> My aim was to determine to what extent the practice of grassy ecosystem restoration was supported and practised, and if so, what structures and systems were in place. And from that experience, I hope to be able to make uh, recommendations that could help our sector. Seed production or seed farming or seed increase is viewed as a fundamental requirement to meet the seed needs for restoration markets in the agricultural landscapes of the US, where wild seed is often critically limited. And while researching uh, and preparing for my tour, it became clear that there are large numbers of organisations and enterprises in the US growing or selling native seed. Most are privately operated, some are government agencies, but all encompassed a wide variety of business models and production models. So shortly after arriving and beginning to uh, visit growers and restoration sites, I realised the state of these sectors was almost the opposite to that which I'd come to know in Australia. It was clear that the physical scale of native seed growing in the US was orders of magnitude larger than here in Australia. For, for example, in Australia, I know of no high-intensity native seed farms greater than 20 hectares in scale, and those this size only grow native grasses. In the US, I visited seed farms that were between 1,000 and 5,000 hectares in size, and these grew crops of hundreds of species of grasses and forbs. To me, the complexity of these enterprises told a clear tale. Growers are willing and able to raise the capital required to start large-scale enterprises. And this is possible because viable markets exist for native seed. These markets create income streams that ensure investments are paid down, operating costs met and profits made. Again, an unfamiliar experience here in Australia. To grow native seed at scale requires significant amounts of infrastructure, equipment and human capital. It requires unique levels of specialisation and knowledge. And it was clear from the farms I visited, these things are abundant. I was shown through several multi-level buildings on any given farm, each devoted to different sets of activities such as admin, seed processing, seed packaging, seed distribution, seed storage, equipment storage and upkeep. I was shown vast arrays of equipment used for seeding, crop maintenance, seed harvest, seed cleaning, packaging, storage, testing and distribution. In the US, I found it common for seed or restoration businesses to employ between 20 to 100 staff. These figures dwarf any operations I know in Australia. And in many instances, these business was, businesses were among the largest and most stable employers in their regions. I found it hard at that point to even dream of such a scenario here in Australia. I was taken to see many restored grasslands and grassy woodlands or savannas, ranging in composition and complexity and structure depending on the goals and sources and degrees of funding, but all re represented effectively restored native vegetation. Some were small, less than 20 hectares, others were vast, up to 5,000 hectares in size. 
Some use modest numbers of native grasses to create fodder or stabilise soils, and others installed hundreds of species to restore highly complex systems. Many included threatened species as subcomponents of overall programs to great effect. The fundamental techniques used to restore grassy communities in the US were not that dissimilar to what we do here in Australia. But because access to seed for restoration is not the issue that it is here in Australia, US restorationists could focus on preparation and planting techniques. And longer term management also focused on similar factors that we deal with, including controlling biomass, weeds, excess tree growth or overgrazing. However, again, the difference was that with many US restorations established with adequately funded programs, they had the planning and budgets to support long-term management, wherever and whatever the challenges arose. This is contrary to our Australian experience, where support for long-term management is something that most managers of native grasslands and grassy woodlands accept as a given. In the end, what impressed me most about the seed growers and restorationists I met was their quite confidence in their ability to rebuild native vegetation. Even noting that some restorations failed to meet ex uh, expectations, these people had a firm belief and confidence in a sector that had the financial and on-ground resources to achieve scale, uh, success at scale. And this was demonstrated by most of the sites I visited. I was slightly envious of their confidence because in the absence of similar markets for restoration, I feel that this is not something will be a feature of the Australian sector for a foreseeable future. One of the most striking aspects of my tour was the realisation that there are several large independent markets that underpin this dynamic and successful sector. Reduced to broad categories, these are the federal and state-based, farm-based conservation programs. There are federal and state-based native roadside programs. And then there are green urban infrastructure related programs. Everyone I interviewed and commented talked about the importance of farm-based agri-environmental programs as market drivers. And with our question, the most prominent was the Conservation Reserve Program. This was signed into law by President Ronald Reagan as a provision of the Federal Food Security Act in 1985. It's administered by the USDA and it operates as a farm rental program in which the federal government operate, uh, rents or retires land, er erodible cropland, uh, such as corn or wheat or oats, and converts it into native vegetation, wildflowers, grasses, trees. The incentive for farmers to enrol in the CRP is that they receive annual rental payments for a contract period of 10 years as well as half the cost of restoring the vegetation. So the farmers also contribute. And growers told me that the CRP payments are comparable to those that come from growing the agricultural crops. So farmers bid for CRP places on a national basis and the bids are assessed using an environmental benefits index. And this favours bids that have a higher environmental or biodiversity outcomes. The CRP is run for 30 years at three 10-year cycles. And during that time, it has created the incentive, but the sector capacity to restore 9.7 million hectares of native vegetation. And that has occurred on 365,000 farms across America at an average rental payment of $29 per hectare. In doing so, the CRP has provided farmers with a fair price to farm native biota. It has helped create a viable and stable market for restoration and it's enabled it to develop formidable production and capacity. Nothing of this type of scale has occurred in Australia to date. There have been many research studies conducted to quantify the outcomes of this continental scale program. And important among them are those that have confirmed reversals in landscape fragmentation and reversals in regional declines in biodiversity. Other benefits have flowed. For example, improvements in farmer health and well-being. The USDA has estimated that CRP lands have achieved an average reduction in soil loss 
from 8.5 to zero, less than 0 0.8 tonnes per hectare per year. That's an amazing outcome, given our importance of soil security here in Australian agriculture. Mitigation of greenhouse gases is another quantifiable effect of the CRP. And Tom Vislak, the US Secretary of Agriculture, reported that the CRP lands has sequestered 44.4 million tonnes of greenhouse gas emissions per year since 1985. And regarding water quality, something else we've spoken about during the conference, it's been reported that nitrogen and phosphorus runoff to waterways on CRP lands has been reduced by 95 and 85 per cent respectively. The USDA administers other farm-based conservation programs that complement the CRP, and examples are the Grassland Reserve Program, the Wetland Reserve Program, the Conservation Reserve Enhancement Program, the Monarch Butterfly. This is amazing. These programs have been achieved through strong legislation and the development of coordinated policy frameworks. There are future challenges for the CRP and similar projects because there is uncertainty about the degree to which future administrations will continue to f support farm bills. And there are also pressures in face of growing demand for increased agricultural production uh, from higher commodity prices. But despite these challenges, at the time of my tour, these farm rental programs were viewed by growers and restorationists as major market drivers. They also created the opportunity to utilise part of the agricultural landscape for conservation, and they allowed farmers to balance stewardship of nature with meeting their agricultural production and economic goals. There are over 6 million kilometres of roads spanning the continental US, and I drove uh, quite, <laughs> quite a way along them. And travelling north from Houston, Texas, to visit the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Centre in um, Austin, I noted regular long stretches of wildflowers blooming in profusion. And can, given their presence seemed to be intentional rather than as remnants, I just dared not believe they were native wildflowers, given such a thing would be unthinkable in Australia. And I commented on this experience, and I was informed, yes, these are Texan wildflower plantings. And I learnt this remarkable landscaping is not uncommon in that state, and more broadly across the US. And I saw similar road signs in many of the states I visited. I learnt these programs are again a legacy of strong leadership and proactive legislation, which commenced in the 1960s. The roadside wildflower movement, imagine that was in large part initiated through the passion and advocacy of Lady Bird Johnson, who is the wife of former President Lyndon Johnson. And President Johnson, after much public advocacy and lobbying by his wife, introduced the Highway Beautification Act in 1965. And this was instrumental. It limited billboard signage and, 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 and reduced rubbish, but it also directed funding to native landscaping on publicly funded roads. And this leadership from the highest level set the stage for other native flora-friendly legislation from both federal and state governments. Important milestones were in 1987 in a program called the Surface Transportation Uniform Relocation Assistant Act signed into law by Ronald Reagan. And that provided funding using 1% of the total highway budget to plant wildflowers. And again in 1994, in an act signed into law by President Clinton, established again clear directions to utilise native species on road sites. US road agencies now recognise that road corridors represent the largest pieces of continuous land for biodiversity habitat if they're planted in native vegetation. They also recognise that natives provide important functional roads on roadside, such as stabilisation and reducing ongoing um, maintenance costs. And there are a number of studies that confirm those outcomes. Beyond that, wildflower plantings are valued for their tourism potential, or wildflower tourism, it was called over there. And many states have established individual wildflower programs with the key goal of attracting tourists to their states. And so by making the vegetated spaces on the US road corridor available for natives, Americans have created a huge footprint for native biota. And the demand for seed and plants created by those programs have provided a huge impetus for the market. 
There are few similar initiatives in Australia, despite our almost 800,000 kilometre road system. And it, prevents a, it provides a potential blank canvas for the restoration of native herbaceous vegetation, with all the associated benefits seen in the US. So in recent decades, this efficient, effective, innovative restoration sector has been able to develop and explore new markets. And one of the most prime markets is the urban market. So as a result, US landscape architects and city designers and planners are increasingly embracing the use of native ground layer species in their city designs. And in doing so, they're creating huge demand for plants and seed. I toured a, a number of nurseries, each of them producing millions of plants for their local urban footprint. And these, these partnerships often generate strong collaboration between growers and architectural teams and local communities. Many of these projects were, were for large organisations such as Walmart and Coca-Cola, and they you know, created landscape around their retail and offices, and others were for municipal councils and libraries and things like that. So the use of natives in urban landscapes was typically undertaken for functional and amenity reasons. But people also recognised these created opportunities for preserving native biota in the built environment. In Australia's cityscapes and infrastructure works, by contrast, there is very little integration of the native ground layer species, apart from the use of a small range of grasses and grass-like species. And this is primarily because seed and plants are seldom available from a broad range of species at prices that are competitive with equitable uh, exotic plants. This would not necessarily be the case if a large restoration ex sector existed here. I don't want to overly idolise the US situation, and certainly I don't suggest that all I learned of was perfect. I saw much, but by no means all facets of the sector. Many of the funding programs I've spoken about have limitations and strengths, and it's certain that some growers are more effective than others, and while many of the restorations are great successes, others fail. However, it is undeniable that remarkable things have been achieved in the US in relation to the restoration of grassy ecosystems. The Americans I met were believers. I was not exposed to the doubt that I commonly experience here in Australia, where questions such as why don't our restoration projects work are commonly debated topics at forums like the one we're at today. In Australia, we tend to doubt whether it's possible to restore diverse native landscapes, whereas in the US it was my impression that it's simply assumed that it can and should be done. Now, belief of this magnitude is a powerful catalyst for progress, and it's one that we sorely need. Decisive government action, as has been displayed in the US, will be critical if we are to move from the current situation of continued loss. Economists have argued that if governments create the right incentives, markets can achieve remarkable things. And that's what I think has occurred in the US. Appropriate legislation has created powerful incentives for farmers and other landscape managers to implement restoration on their land. And this huge market has fostered and enabled the US restoration sector to develop and eventually achieve remarkable things. Without government leadership, I find it hard to believe I would have found what I did. I suspect I would have found something that more resembled the situation we have here in Australia today. I believe we need prime ministers and premiers and government and ministers to take on a true leadership role in forming policy and legislation that supports the preservation of native species through restoration and conservation. Now, our, our leaders cannot be expected to have the background or knowledge to form grand visions if they are not informed and inspired by others. And for that task, we need passionate and articulate advocates from research and practice to inform and to guide and to challenge our leaders to use their positions to create transformative change. It will require researchers to focus less on publication output and more on advocacy. It will require practitioners to focus less on 
whose method is best practice and more on building our sector. None of this will be easy or straightforward, but it has been achieved in the United States. There is no technical reason why in Australia we must watch our native grassy ecosystems disappear forever. My own work has convinced me that they can re be, re be rebuilt on farms and on roadsides and in urban areas. Indeed, while I finalised a manuscript which described my, um, my US tour, I spent several weeks touring and monitoring old uh, grassland restorations that I undertook in Victoria, and most of these are now 15 years in age. And happily, <laughs> I found most comparable in quality and condition to the best grassland remnants I know of. And at the time, at the same time, I found precious remnants maddeningly degrading, seem seemingly through neglect and inertia. And standing as I did during these surveys in beautiful, resilient, functional, species-rich restorations, I found it hard to fathom why some in our sector are so resistant to the notion of redemption through restoration. Why does our sector not have the confidence to embrace these approaches? Why don't we offer farmers the incentives they need to return native grassy ecosystems to parts of their holdings? Why don't we expect our road agencies to replace roadsides covered in exotics with natives? Why is it that our native ground, flayer, ground layer flora is not more commonly integrated into our urban landscapes? The feasibility and the benefits of all these actions have been demonstrated in the United States. Why not here? As a sector, I believe we must dispense with doubt and embrace belief. We can no longer afford to create the illusion of activity, as has been the case for decades, when there has been so little progress and so much loss. We must put our shoulders to the wheel, we must grow seed, we must restore complex red vegetation and create change for the good. We must stop fearing failure. And where it occurs, we learn and move forward. All this can be done. And meanwhile, across the Pacific, in the US, year on year, seemingly astronomical quantities of native seed and plants are distributed across the broad American landscape, creating an ever-increasing environment of diverse, functional, resilient native vegetation. Surely our goal must be to strive for a day when a similar thing could be said about Australia. Thank you. Lottery, uh, the, the EC has directives to do this. In America, for whatever reason, they have gone down the path of these farm bills that started in the Dust Bowl base and created agricultural incentive programs. Now, they may not be the right thing for us, but they demonstrate that if you can provide the framework and the long-term support for these sorts of things to happen, then people like us, with all our bright ideas and our huge passion, can find a way to actually implement that. That is what, more than anything, America demonstrated to me. It's not that they have more knowledge than you and I, it's they've found a way to apply it. And they've had presidents and state governors and remarkable people get in there and jump up and down. That is something that I think is sorely lacking in Australia. And we've got to find a way to shake those people up. Thank you. 